that's fine. That's your privilege. That's your right. And I don't hold anything against you. But I would like to meet with you, Ron and Michael. I would like to meet with you and see if we can get things straightened out to where you where you feel more comfortable with the way things went. So, if you if you could, and I don't know who you are, I have no idea. But if you would get a hold of us, where we can sit down calmly and sensibly. And, and try to work these things out if we can. So, uh, but it's a. I think that it's it's a good thing. And and I understand. I really do. There are a lot of memories in this building for a lot of people. But we can also make. We can take these memories from this building into the other building. You know, we're not just going to, there'll be pictures of this building, there'll be pictures of things that, that went on in this building, and there'll be things that are written down, that were baptized, where the baptisms were, those are in a book, and we can take those with us. You know, so when somebody says, well, when was he baptized? And, and we can tell them, and we can say, he was in the old sanctuary. You know, the first one in the new in the new one, you know, it'll be number one. It'll be the very first one in that show. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is there's gonna be some there will be some part time. It's not just gonna flood. You know, it's just not gonna you know, but if we all work together and we, we don't get mad and we work these, these things out calmly, it's going to be a great thing. So, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we ended negotiations on the morning. I negotiated uh, for the last two or three weeks. The price started at $275,000. After negotiations, uh, we got it down to $30,000 off of that price, and we got a new parking lot. They told us the parking lot that they put in was $60,000. So it came down really well for us. I opened a path to us, and we are going to start the process of purchase uh, this Tuesday. Uh, the building replacement, if that was built today, the new building, it would cost us $540,000. And the estimate land value over there is thirty to $50,000. So if we was to build over in that location today, it would cost us nearly $600,000. We will have $245,000 in that building. Renovation, we estimate at $100,000. So we'll have approximately $324,000 in the new building. Our building is about 21 years old. Our building today is 131 years old with many, many problems. Uh, when we start Tuesday, we will put a thousand dollars down for escrow, which secures our ability to purchase. And that security will be for 10, 10 to 15 days. We will also get the building inspector within that 10 day period. We will have an architect come in and look for the planning stages. Of renovations, we hope we can do on that ourselves. Um, I think that will be the first week, like Tuesday to the next week. So, within possibly 15 days, that new church will be our church. Um, 
want to say uh, just a few words here. If we write an autobiography of ourselves, we would have to give homage to those who came before us. And their commitment to honor God, we have built a, they have built a bridge into our future. Their lives echo forth from the past, calling us into the offering. 131 years ago, it was their time to build. Today, we have been chosen to continue our heritage for the next generations. And we all have attachments. Attachments are difficult because that means we care about someone or we care about something. We have been elevated in God's word here. Assembly among these four walls here. Raise Christians here. But the time has come and has been reached to give fall to the old, old walls. It is time to reestablish our Christian family among new homes, building a new future, building a new generation of believers to enhance our servitude to our God. This is the vision of faith on that side. Announcements for this morning. Of course, uh, tonight, well, there's a BBS meeting after the worship service. Uh, tonight, at 6 o'clock, is small groups. Wednesday, 9 a.m., is a uh, woman faithful fellowship. Adult Bible study in Jack Cadets at 6 o'clock on Wednesday, and Saturday is a leadership meeting. The next reconnect of area churches is. It's next yeah. Sunday, Richard, and that's going to be at the Hopedale Park. It'll be similar to what we did at Sally Buffalo last Sunday. By the way, if you're out there, a great time, won't you? Amen. But the area churches, the Union Court, Caddis, uh, other ones have been invited uh, from our churches. And uh, starting at 3 o'clock, games. There's going to be envelopes out there, cornhole, horseshoes, uh, those yard guys. <laughs> uh, we got a badminton set, there's basketballs there, there's tennis court, there's softball. Dinner will be at 5, and if the weather's bad, we just meet here at 5 for dinner. How's that, folks? Yeah. <laughs> we'll 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 we bring stuff on ice, we'll cook hamburgers and hot dogs. Man. Okay, the opening hymn this morning is Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. So I think we probably ought to maybe get on our feet. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, he soldiers on the cross. Live by his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory up to victory, this army shall be lead. Everybody is thankful, Christ is glory in me. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, and come and call the band. For Jesus, this is for us today. To battle in the spirit against a younger foe. Praise God in winter and strength and strength of foes. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. We are the best group there. We cannot trust the Lord. Put on the gospel banner. 
When we gather at the Lord's table, we need to take a threefold look. First, we need to look back to the cross and the suffering that Jesus did there. Remember how he gave himself unselfishly to atone for the sins of the world. Second look is to the present, here and now. We look at ourselves. What do we see? How are we living? Are we striving to put Jesus first in our lives? Or does he come in for third? Let us truly examine ourselves and look deep into our hearts. God wants us to acknowledge our sin and humbly ask for forgiveness. The third look is to the future. Are we looking forward to communion with Jesus and his kingdom? Are we looking for his coming with joy or fear? If we knew Jesus was returning tonight, how would we spend the rest of our day? Can we say I wouldn't do anything different than what I, what I do any other day? How wonderful if we could say that. Then we can confidently pray, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Communion Him is more precious than silver. I'm 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this. I thank you for teaching, teaching us how to pray. And Heavenly Father, I thank you for what your Son has done for each and every one of us. When he stood at the door and knocked, and we were brave enough to open the door and let him go. I thank you for this. And Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Old Testament, which was the law. And you give the law to Moses, and he give it to all your people. And then your son was on the side. And it wasn't the law anymore. It was his teachings through the apostles. And Heavenly Father, I thank you for these things. I thank you for your love that you showed us. And I know there's times that we are disappointed. We go astray. But when we notice this, we turn around and we go back. And what do we see? We see you there standing with your arms outreached to take us back in. And Heavenly Father, I do thank you for. The things that we do that make us stronger Christians because you said you would never give a single word and won't leave a hand. And I thank you for this. But each time I know that if it's a test that we don't have to share with, each time the load gets full of everything. You're always there. You know, it's not my legs and my back that carries the load. It's your legs and it's your back. Because I give it to you. And Heavenly Father, the men that stand up here, tall and proud, bless them. We would because they're serving their people today. Now that Heavenly Father, the bread is upon the table, would you bless them? Because we all know that it's the symbol of your son's power. That means Calvary to each and one of each and every one of us, but also when he came out of the tomb, the job still wasn't done. He walked among us, and now he stands at your right hand, as Stephen said. So, with this, I thank you. All the heavens are going to us, too. See if you can hear it. You can call it. You can stop it. It's a
This morning we'll be married to the beautiful. And uh, as we prepare for our prayer time, our updates and additions, uh, of course, continue to pray for uh, for the church and the outreach, for those who need to make a decision, and for those who have fallen away and need to come back. Also, uh, Tony Caper for some health related problems, Jennifer Haskell for terminal illness. Bill Weaver, that's Joe Craven's father-in-law, had Gables uh, near the end. Lauren Welsh, out of the hospital, but still failing to come. Joe Reed, second surgery this Tuesday, removing his lower leg. Jacqueline Henry, his doctor, has decided to a strategy for her tumor. Jerry Zenny had a procedure on the 5th in Steubenville. Uh, Tom Zenny recovering from surgical procedure. Haas Rachel for health-related problems. Jessica Harris, so many of you know, if you don't know her married name, her maiden name is Jess Atkins. Uh, it says here that she's here giving birth, and I uh, want to pray well. She gave birth to Lane Michael Harris, 7 pounds, 9 ounces, 21 inches long, at Trinity Med Medical Center West. Okay, uh, Alicia Hilton's procedure went well, and it's providing a lead. So we have an anonymous request. Also, for Brother Dave, whose mother passed this week, Brother Dave, for he had a rough few weeks. Okay. Well, let's do everything is fine. Okay. Okay. As I said, prayer again this morning is very beautiful. After which, Brother Randy will lead our hearts in prayer. <laughs> Oh, 
This is Family Sunday, so we will not be discussing for children's church. But I asked him if the battles of the Republic. Oh, 
as aliens and strangers, to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or the governors as sent by means the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing what? By doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. That's kind of taken a little section of, of his whole discourse on being submissive and living godly lives and living lives of a pilgrim. And he goes on and talks more about living submitted lives to, to the Heavenly Father. But as I read that passage, I see several things. And you know, isn't it amazing that if I were to ask you this morning, where could we go in the Bible and find God's expectations for us as citizens of America? It, I, I went to First Peter 2, but how many of you also know you, you could have thought of another passage in which we could have read and some of the very same things would have been mentioned about honoring God, uh, being law-abiding citizens. In fact, the first slide we're going to bring up here today, I just want to give out to our Bible. The first one, how many of you agree that if you're going to be a Christian, you ought to be what's called law-abiding? Right? Law abiding. Hey, well, can you say that with me? Law abiding. When you're going down the road this afternoon, 65 miles an hour on the way to Kansas, just remember to repeat that to yourself. Right? Going the other way, no problem. <laughs> Law abiding. Romans chapter 13, the Apostle Paul talks about this. And I'll be honest, Paul mentioned something in here that I just don't like, so I think I'm going to take it out of my Bible. How's that? Can you do that? Uh, Romans 13. No, we can't do that. But in Romans 13, the Apostle Paul talked about the law abiding. Every person, this is the first one, every person can be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. And he goes on down there and farther uh, and talks about we ought to pay taxes as well. <laughs> How many of you really enjoy paying taxes? Okay. I'm not against paying taxes, but I believe since we do live in America and we do have a right to vote for elected officials, that it would be in our best interest to vote for individuals that would have our tax interests at heart. Do you not agree? <laughs> do you not agree? Uh, I used to joke around about the, the new tax form that they, they had. By the way, the original tax form was only two pages. In 1913, when they began the tax on our earnings, the original tax form was number one, was page one was the instructions, and page two was the form. And you basically filled out your name and address, how much you made, you sent it, and 10%. That was it. <laughs> you know, but uh, my new tax form, you know, the way it's going is you fill out your name, tell us how much you made, and you send it all. <laughs> you send it all. <laughs> it's, it seems to be getting that way. But law abiding, our founding fathers even understood the importance of abiding by the law. And that's why when they set up the American government through that tumultuous time, by the way, the Revolutionary War, eight year war from 1775, when the fight actually began in April of 1775, and then 1776, you know, the framers of the Declaration of Independence says they were in the midst of that war. But the war lasted from 1775 all the way to 1783 until September. So eight years that revolutionary war. But during that time, they were forming the framework of the Constitution. And then in 1787, the Constitution began. And a lady come up and asked Ben Franklin, what have you given us, sir? A monarchy or a republic? And he said, a republic, ma'am. 
if you can keep it. Which indicates that our forefathers understood the importance of being law-abiding citizens. And so they put our government in three branches. Can you name them? The judicial, legislative, executive. One of those is responsible for writing laws. Legislative. One of those is responsible for interpreting law. One of those is responsible for seeing that the laws are very good. That's why it's nothing. Right? That's why it's nothing. And, and if you pay attention to history, um, you, you notice that those branches don't know what they're doing, they're supposed to be doing. But they, they should be. They realize that we have to have a set of laws to be, by which to be bound. By the way, another phrase that makes our, our nation great as law abiding citizens is that phrase, he. Pluribus uno. It's a Latin phrase meaning many out of one. It carries the idea that we would love others more than we love ourselves. And so that we can have differences, and what kind of gets you know, another point that I have later on in the message, just kind of throw it in here. We have freedoms. We are freedom loving people. And so that e pluribus uno, that is on the seal of the United States. As I was researching, it said it's on a five dollar bill, it's also on the one dollar bill. I pulled out a five dollar bill and I couldn't find it. And so finally I saw that one spot that was there. I didn't see it. There's a huge eagle right by on the right side of Abraham Lincoln's picture there. There's a huge eagle and it's got the e pluribus. I wouldn't be good at counterfeiting. I would have missed that. I would have left that out over there. You know what I'm saying? I had Abraham Lincoln's picture there. But e pluribus is it's also on the seal of the executive branch of government. Uh, it's also on the seal for the House of Representatives and the Senate. It's also on the seal for the Supreme Court, which means that all of us are expected to be law abiding citizens. And you can finish this phrase for me no one is above the law. The law. Okay, no one. And so, but what's that, what's that do then when we say, wait a minute, I'm a Christian because I have the law of God to consider? So, what do I do then if there's a law of my country here on earth that violates the law of my God. Can you think of any individual in the Bible where that happened? Like in Babylon, in Daniel, right? Where Daniel's law said he praised the one true God, but they made a law that said you can't pray to any other God except the God of, of Darius, you know. So what Daniel did, he chose to honor God above. As our forefathers said, Either God, capital G, will be your king, capital K, or your king, lowercase k, will be your God, lowercase g. Did you get that? Either God will be your king, or your earthly king will be your God. And James Madison said, we staked our whole future on our ability to follow the Ten Commandments with all our hearts. John Adams said that morality and religion alone establish the principles upon which freedom can securely stand. So in answer to that second point, I need to be a law-abiding citizen. But number two, more importantly, I need to be a Christ-honoring. Can we say that one together? Christ-honoring uh, Christian and citizen as well. How do we do that? We must first of all know God's word. And in Acts chapter 4, Here's a, here's a situation where the first century Christian ran into what many today would consider a dilemma. There had been a wonderful miracle performed, and, and the early Christians were preaching the gospel. But how many of you know there were people who were opposed to Jesus, as they are today? And so in Acts chapter 4, verse 17, those who were opposed who didn't want to hear about Christianity, decided they would try this strategy. And here's what they said in Acts 4, 17. This is, these are the enemies speaking. They said, but so that it will not spread any farther among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, Whether it's Christ the Son of God to give me to you, rather to God, you be the pledge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Now that's what they said. 
We cannot stop speaking. You know what I heard when they said that? They said we cannot. I heard we will not. We will not stop speaking. And they did. When they were released, they were partly threatened, and then they were released, and they went out and continued to teach and preach. And in Acts chapter 5, they were arrested again, and they were put in prison. But then an angel of the Lord came and released them from prison. And in Acts 5, verse 20, the angel of the Lord gives a different order. The world had said, don't speak in his name. The angel said, go stand and speak to the people in the temple, the whole message of his life. Whose orders are you going to obey? The world's or the, the word of the Lord through, through the angel servant. So they went and, and kept teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. They came looking for them in prison. The, the soldiers came and they said, oh, they're in the temple here. They went down and arrested them again. Third time, they say it's a charm, right? In Acts 5, verse 27, the apostles are brought again before the council, and the high priest questioned in verse 28, said, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. What did, Paul, what did Peter say? We must obey God rather than man. So we want to be law abiding, assuming that the law of the land doesn't violate God's law. But if it violates God's law, then we must go with God's law. Amen? Amen. So be careful here. So go to the third point. We are also freedom loving. And in Romans 14, we are talking about. Judging others. And this is a difficult area for many because they think they know what God's word teaches and they are radical in their beliefs. And how many of you know every religion has radicals, right? I understand with the war against the terrorists, all this debate going on about Islam and all this. And from what I understand, there are those who are Islam who are not interested in killing us, and then there are those who are Islam and are interested in killing us, you know? So you've got the, these extremes, and uh, you have the same thing in so-called Christianity during the Crusades back in the 1500s, where the Roman Catholic Church, for instance, they were so radical that if you didn't agree with them, they felt so threatened, you know what they would do to you? They'd kill you as well. You know, those radicals. And so, how do we how do we take this fine line of, I want to obey God, and I want to honor God, but also allow others to have some freedom in their lives? Notice what Romans 14, 1 says. You're going to have some who are weak in faith. Except the one who is weak in faith. Not for the person, not for the purpose of passing judgment on what? His opinions. Can we say that word together? Are we going to say that word in the Church of Christ? Opinion? Ready? One, two, three. Opinions. Because in some churches, whether it's Church of Christ or any other church, in some churches, you're not allowed to have an opinion. You either think like us or you can go. You know? That's your attitude. You think like me or you're wrong. And I believe that the forefathers of our of our Christian faith in the Restoration Movement, as we call it, back in the 1800s, when you had all these denominations, and they're all speaking different things. There was all this confusion. And then someone came up with this idea. They said, why don't we just go back to the Bible and see what the Bible says? Amen. Why don't we read the Bible and ask for the ancient past? And if we're wrong, let's confess it to God, and let's forsake what's wrong, and let's start clinging to what's right. Amen. Amen. And they came up with this phrase. And I believe if you balance it carefully with scripture, you can use this in your philosophy of freedom loving people. It went something like this. In essentials, unity. In opinions, liberty. But in all things, love. I don't hear heard that before you know that phrase. But that was in the 1830s. And preachers in Steubenville, like Walter Scott, Martin W. Silk, Alexander Campbell, people would go for miles to hear these preachers preach in the late 1820s. And there were people from Oakdale area, Caddis area, that took their, their wagon, I almost said their cart and horses, but that's what it would be, that the horse back, or they would walk, and they would hear these preachers preach about 
let's call Bible things by Bible names and let's do Bible things in Bible ways, right? It's just like in our country where we're trying to go back and restore the principles of the, what's the founding document of our country? Uh oh, it's called the well, there's Declaration of Independence, where, but that was declaring their independence. That's when they're telling Britain, here's why we're leaving you. Okay. Oh, there it is, the Constitution. So even in it, and it's like, how many have actually read the Constitution? There was a federal court judge last week that said he believed that it was a waste of time to even read the Constitution. A federal court judge! And so we've thrown that document aside. And so in the religions, Religious realm in 1820s, people from Hopedale Cast were going to students over there hearing his preacher saying, Let's go back to the constitution of God's church, which is the Bible. And let's go Bible things by Bible names and Bible things in Bible ways in essentials. And you need to write this down, ready? In essentials, unity. The Bible says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There are places where the Bible says, Thus, Thanks. I can't say it. Help me this morning. Thus saith the Lord. And those are areas of essentials. And we need to be united on those things. But in areas of opinion, liberty. What are areas of opinion? Well, one, you better know what the Bible says so you know what areas of opinion are. But I know what some areas of opinion are, like the way we dress. Dressing modestly is not an opinion. That's an essential. But whether you wear a tie, all right, or a dress, or ladies' uh, pantsuits, slacks, ladies' slacks, I don't know. I mean, there's some churches, though, if you're a lady and wear slacks, you're going to hell. Because the Bible says in areas of essentials that a man is not to wear that which pertains to a woman, and a woman is not to wear that which pertains to a man. Those are the way they present themselves. Even if you have long hair as a man, it better be for a godly reason, like the Nazarite vow. If it wasn't, you're just doing it out of authority. Apostle Paul says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. All right? That's essential. But don't go judging someone if they do. They might be keeping the Nazarite vow. In regards to dress, <coughs> ladies, just so you know, I will always place an invite as a man and I will not wear a dress. But I'm trying to explain to where is it the, the guys that play the bagpipes and all the guests of the I guess over there, that's the man's apparel. Not for me. You have to weigh all that out. All right? But in areas of opinion, I'm not wearing a tie today. Some churches I'd be going to help the down the tie. That's the area of opinion. If you had a baseball cap on your head today in the building, some folks say, hey, get that out of the building. Folks, you better read 1 Corinthians 11 again. That's the area of opinion. Because the, the covering of which he speaks in 1 Corinthians 11 not a hat. The covering given to the woman is her hair. And when the man prays with his head covered, Paul was saying is when he's got long hair, it doesn't have to do with having a baseball cap on him. But again, that's a discussion for another day, I suppose. But I may understand the problem with that. Areas of opinion, areas of liberty. You can pursue any occupation you want in this country. Amen? As long as it honors God, you can be a truck driver, a doctor, a lawyer. Be a politician, be a minister, you be a policeman, you be a secretary, you be a hairdresser, all those things. You can serve grace and be part. I said that because I was counseling a man years ago. His name is Dominic. I don't remember exactly his name, but 20 some years ago. And he was talking about being baptized. Out of blue, he said, I'm going to have to change the jobs. I didn't see that coming. I said, What? Because we're talking about repenting of our sins and being baptized. He said, I'm going to I'm gonna change the job. I'm going to be baptized. I said, why? He says, I'm a bartender. Well, no. and then he said, in a strip club. I said, oh! <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm thinking to myself, I'm so glad you mentioned it. Because if I was going ahead of time, I'd be like, I do approach this. I do approach this. Sadly, he never was baptized. Wouldn't give up his job. And uh, to me, that was essential. I said, you're right. I didn't tell him it was a thing. Well, you know, you keep working there, you know, no. In the world, but not of the world. Freedom loving. I hope that made some sense there on that. To allow people to be who they are. You don't have to be like me. You don't have to be like me. 
exactly who I am. You don't have to like what I like or dislike what I like. Unless it's in regard to the essentials of the unity of the faith, we, chapter 4, will list at least seven of them for you there. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father, one Spirit, one Holy Spirit. Let's go to the fourth one. Hope about it. Let's stay in the church here. Well, we need to tell people when you need to tell us about the same time. So where do you go to church? You stay away. No one makes me hope yet. I don't always tell them Church of Christ stuff. If I do tell them Church of Christ, I'm not to explain. No, I'm not self dating but that's why I'm going to talk about saying, Oh, you're self dating No. I normally tell them, I'm with the church in hotel. Which one? I said the Church of Christ is associated with the Christian churches with Christ. Folks, I simply do that because in our country of America, people are confused. If you say Church of Christ, up north it's not too bad, but down south, they don't have pianos. That's my opinion, folks. But there's people that you don't have pianos that say we're going to hell because we do have one. All right, that's not freedom love. Right? They they don't like eating in church buildings either. See, that's wrong. Because what Paul told the Corinthians in chapter eleven, I'll have you know, folks, that when we eat our dinners here, we ne- we never leave anyone out of the Lord's supper. That's what they were doing at the church of Corinth. I also have you know, folks, whenever we have our church dinners here, we don't even have the Lord's Supper with our church dinners. It's completely separate. All right, so don't try to go there. It will fall said The Corinthians would put their Lord's Supper with the meal and everything. We don't do that. We make sure everybody gets the Lord's Supper. Amen? Right we don't leave anybody out. In the early church, they met in their homes. That was their church building, their home. And they ate there as well. All the morning, the Corinthians were in a situation here. We don't fit into that. All right? But there was one church of Christ down south. <laughs> they didn't believe in eating in the church building. And here's how here's how they solved it. They were having a church dinner on the property there. And someone said, I thought y'all didn't eat in the church building. They said, Oh, we're not. So over there is where we have our worship area. And they had another room all together, all together separate from where they ate. And the guy said, yeah, but you're still in the same building. He said, no, we're not. When we laid the, the foundations, we got two separate foundations on these buildings, and we separated the two foundations by an inch so they weren't touching each other. Strain it and that, and what? Swallow of a camel, what they were doing. Listen, folks, I've noticed a lot of times the legalistic, far-right, strict churches even the ones that say the lady's going to hell and wearing a slack. There's no joy. If you ever done steps of this church, there's no joy. And in Romans chapter 5, I don't have time. I'm going to take time today to read it today. But there are about 12, at least 12 points that you can put on your clock. For each number on the clock from 12 to 12, we have justification in Christ. We have his Holy Spirit. We are standing in God's grace. We have, we have joy because of our persecution, and our persecution gives us proof of character, and our proof of character gives our, our persecution gives us perseverance, and our perseverance gives us proof of character, and our proof of character gives us hope because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts since we've been justified. What's that mean? All charges have been. And it gives us hope. Our hope is upon the the salvation we have in Christ. And at the conclusion there, as you read through Romans 5, he says, we have received the reconciliation, meaning we've been brought back to God. Listen, in the Garden of Eden, we were alienated. But from Bethlehem, then from Rebecca in Egypt, then to Nazareth, eventually to Galilee, and eventually to Jerusalem, the Garden of Gethsemane, and on Golgotha, and then from an empty tomb, we're no longer alienated. We are now reconciled. Brought back to God. And so we are a hope abounding people. And so maybe when, maybe when they ask this week, where do you attend services? You can say, I go to the Hope Day. Church of Christ. And focus on that hope line. One more point. Could I just one before we go? All right. Law abiding, can you do it with me? Law abiding, Christ honoring, freedom loving, hope abounding, burden bearing, burden bearing. The reason they call it responsibility bearing, I mean, so 
birthday bearer. I tell you, the first sign of letting down on our responsibilities is helping each other bear their burdens. Galatians chapter 6. I believe it would be the passage that I have referenced, but I'm going to check it out here. There it is. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 through 5. Burden bear. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Let me have burdens. But the book also says, so I asked you have purpose to ask how many of you have burdens? The book also says in that scripture that you also are to carry your own burden. But at the same time, when you're carrying your own burden, you help others bear their <coughs> burden. The first time we lower our responsibility of doing that, in other words, of not being our brother's people, that is the first sign that that brother or sister might collapse by our failure to support them. We're going to support each other. We support that one. There's something that's holding up the roof of this building, by the way. I don't know what's holding up the roof. Let's hold up the roof. Pardon? I like that one over there. God. I think someone said God. God's holding up the roof. Honey child, that's an awesome statement, but in this case, there's got to be more God that's holding it up. Anybody know what's holding up the roof? Rafters, right? All those rafters. The trusses, right? Now, what's holding all those trusses up there? I heard it, I think. Walls. Not the foundation. Even if the foundation wasn't here, it would be sitting on the ground. But what's holding those factors in place? What happens if I take out this wall right here? Let's just take it out. What would happen? I don't know. It might still stay up. Three walls. What if I take this one and that one? What are those walls called? Randy? Load. Load bearing walls. Load bearing walls. So when you go into like a back wall, say we want to push that out and go that way, we just take the thing. We have to ask, is that a load bearing wall? My point is this every Christian is a load bearing wall for somebody. That's how important you are. So you don't ever say, well, I don't know your value, nobody cares, nobody loves me. You may feel no one loves you, but God does, and you've got room for brothers and sisters that you do. That love you. We're not always real good, I guess. I mean, this past week, I wasn't real good at getting around being a little very warm for some folks. I had what I thought was a problem with I mentioned last week. It was an alternator, okay? Bessie's car said, what? Bessie's car, remember one running last week? It was in the garage. I knew she didn't hit the at least, but... <laughs> It was an alternator. I was having some problems getting it on. Finally got it on. She's up and running. Thank you. That flat tire. <laughs> Coming up my throat with that big boy. It sounded like a cicada in the trunk. It did, seriously. Like, cicada. Cicada in my trunk. Then I got up there and got up there to Todd Atkins' place, Sharon Atkins' burnout, and was pulled out of the leather flat. Here come along, Randy. Thank you, Jimbo. Ready to do it for that. You see, Randy come down the road, he got a flat. <laughs> Went over his place. He fixed the tire. He showed me how I can fix it next time. You know, that's burden bearing. Information sharing. Hey, there's no. That's the sixth point he was both best. How find the problems? Paul repeated. Comes riding through the night. What's he shouting? Where is he coming? Where is he coming? The militia, who by the way was led by a minister, I can't remember his name now, but a minister was a leader of the militia. And what what does militia carry with that? Weapons. And when they encountered the British troops, the commander of the British troops says, lay down your arms. That's gun control a bit. The first order of gun control was when the British troops looked at the American colonists, colonists and said, lay down your arms. Did they? No. If they had, they'd been subject to King George III for the rest of their lives. But in 1775, they're a motto, a phrase, 
that was adopted by our political leaders and eventually adopted by the colonists. And when James Madison was asked, who is your king? He said, we have no king but King Jesus. We have no governor but the sovereign God of this universe. And so when they refused to lay down their arms, I want to remind you that the early American colonists, the reason we broke free from the most powerful nation on the planet, Britain, at that time, thousands of miles away from us, an eight-year battle and war, and finally won our independence. Praise God. I'm like you. I'm glad we lived in the United States of the USA and America and all that stuff. And God, we trust me first, you and all that. But I want you to know that these folks, not only did they have open Bibles, they had loaded weapons as well, based on Jesus' teaching when he said, if you don't have a sword, go buy one. Luke chapter 22 and verse number 36. It's easy to remember this in chapter 22. Anybody got a 22? It's hard to remember the verse because I wish it had been 44, like Luke 22, 44, you know what I'm saying? Luke 22, 38, whatever you get. You are allowed to defend yourself. Why? Because in that defense, you can continue to live and proclaim Jesus Christ. Open Bibles, loaded weapons, burden bearers, information sharers, all for the glory of God. This song wasn't around back then that we're going to sing right now, but I can see our family fathers as they were made to hear us sing it today. And it wasn't our father who is in Washington. It's our father who is in heaven. Read that if you haven't read it yet from the bulletin. The radio broadcast by Paul Harvey. You'd have thought he wrote it today. But it's back in April 1965 that it aired. And he said, if I was the devil, this is what I would do. In order to turn a society into a glory society. This song though turns it all around and takes it from young and glory to honorable and glorious to Jesus Christ the Lord. God bless you this week. As you are as an American citizen and you are a law abiding Christian citizen, I'm a Christ person. Let's stand as we sing. Let's imagine the smile of our forefathers in this country, most of the smile of our Father in heaven. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit that is love us. Let's also the picture the smiles upon heaven that the next for the honor of each The sweat is Oh, <laughs> 